up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Kevin Jackwoods. This is the Cage Review, and more importantly, this is the Rock and Metal Review. And today I wanted to do something a little bit differently. I've been posting a lot of new bands to me. So I wanted to go back real quick and show everybody my top 10 favorite albums of all time. Now here's the thing about albums. It's not necessarily my favorite bands, not necessarily my favorite songs. Album means that from beginning to end, it was something that I either identified with and it impacted me somehow personally and every song on there was something good for the most part or it was just a really great jam all the way through. And it has to be consistent and that's the big thing with me when I'm doing albums because I can have a favorite song and the rest of the album sucks or I can have a favorite band but they dropped something that I just wasn't happy with. So with album, it's a little bit different. These are things that impacted me personally and have kind of fallen me through my years. So starting off with number 10. I think in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, Metallica probably ruled the airwaves. This is at a time where rock music and metal music actually owned the radios. Pop was not as big as rock and metal. Rap was barely even heard of, really. I mean, it was there, but it was in its infancy. And so, the king of metal at that time had to be Metallica. I mean, you had Ozzy Osbourne, who was absolutely huge, Judas Priest, uh, Iron Maiden, Rush was still pretty big. But Metallica just took over. And two albums I had to tie for number 10, because I just could not pick one. Master of Puppets, I think, is a give me. Uh, Master of Puppets, every song on there was just absolutely amazing. It was technically sound. There were a lot of songs that were nine minute anthems that had long guitar solos, a lot of uh, instrumental pro processions in there, where it was very honestly um, it was amazing Kirk Hammett uh, while not being necessarily the most technical when it comes to guitar riffs they all sounded good and he was very very good at solos like Kirk Hammett he could jam out and Lars Ulrich even though he gets a lot of slack as a drummer you don't get that big by being bad Lars Ulrich was very good he has spot on timing, he, uh, he tried to add some technical proficiency to his drumming with a lot of the starts and stops and uh, a lot of the fills he did, and he was fast. You cannot knock the guy. So honestly, I was a huge fan of Metallica. I remember Injustice for All, which is the other album that I have to add to this equation. I would sit there and practice every song on Injustice for All. and. Uh, Lars Ulrich, at the beginning stages of my drumming career, was one of my idols, honestly. Like, the guy was just damn good. I didn't realize how good drumming could get, but to me, I was fascinated with him at the time. So, ladies and gentlemen, Metallica gets the number 10 spot with And Justice For All and Master of Puppets. Number nine on my list is Disturbed. A little bit newer now, we're into the 2000s. And Indestructible, for me, was a monster jam album. Uh, I love Disturbed, they are definitely one of my favorite bands. I love the aggression, I love the sound. I love that they push the envelope. And they approach it with a business sense. But to just get in there and have a jam session of a record, this would be my pick. Indestructible had so many good songs. Uh, and namely, Indestructible itself, the title track, and there was a song called Haunted on it, which I absolutely love, and is actually the intro for my rock and metal review intro. Absolutely love that song. I think it is phenomenal. So Disturbed has stuck with me through the years, and this is another album being a drummer that I would put on and I would just drum out to to every damn song on the album. It was just good beginning to end, no weak spots at all. 
Um, and the song right after Haunted is called Enough. And that was another song that I really, really liked. So, I honestly think you couldn't get much better from Disturbed than Indestructible. Phenomenal. For number eight, I'm going back to one of my earliest, earliest, earliest motivations. Um, I think it was my cousin who had bought Rush Chronicles. And in Chronicles, it's the only compilation album on this list. And I chose this one because it's a double album that literally does chronicle Rush's main hits from the birth of the band all the way up until what was recent time. And, I mean, you're talking songs like 2112, Overture, uh, Subdivisions, Red Sector A, so many good songs. Tom Sawyer, Limelight, YYZ. I could go on for a half hour probably naming all the songs on that album. And most of them are just damn good. Uh, they even have songs that I think a lot of people would overlook, like The Trees, which I absolutely loved, which is kind of like an analogy of racism. Rush had a lot of heart, but they were three technically proficient musicians that got together and created a monster. And I think they started in the 60s. Um, yeah, they did start in the 60s. I remember somebody, I did a review of one of their songs and somebody gave me a lot of mess because they're like, oh, 60s, ha ha ha. And it turns out they started in like 68. Um, really good band. Amazing band. And uh, Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson together, the guitarist and bassist, were phenomenal. So, I remember playing both CDs on this double album and not really not liking one song on there. Everything hit home with me in some way, form, or fashion. So ladies and gentlemen, Rush is number eight. They deserve maybe to even be higher, to be quite frankly. Like Rush might deserve to be higher because they are such a good band. And that album, I mean, to showcase Rush's career, it's going to be damn good. Number seven is Children of Bodom, Are You Dead Yet? And this album for me really struck home because this is probably the album where I transitioned from like rock and pop rock and the metal that you would hear on the radio to really the growling, the screaming, the super heavy riffs. Uh, Children of Bodom definitely made that transition for me. And it was because the music was so damn good. Like, I think before this, I couldn't really get past the growling and screaming. But this really sold me, and I didn't care. Uh, I was just hooked. And Are You Dead Yet, the song right there, Living Deadbeat. Uh, just amazing, amazing bands. Uh, like this come along once in a generation, really. Like, they, they're kind of like the New Age Judas Priest. They're super fast. They're a little controversial. They got the dueling guitar sounds. They're just an updated version. And a much harder version, to be frank. And it just, it grabs me. Uh, very fast drums. Very, very, very fast. And that's one thing I loved about this band. Being a drummer, of course, I got caught. Number six is not even from this country. It's Rammstein. Most people that listen to rock and metal in the States are still familiar with Rammstein. They're from Germany. And they kind of helped introduce the phrase new metal. Uh, them with Korn and Limp Biscuit, they came in and they kind of created a new subgenre. Uh, they had a lot of little synthesizers and uh, effects and keyboards. Um, and still with a very heavy background. And the album I chose is Zen Zuck, which is god damn good. This is the album that has, most people are familiar with Du Hast, if they're familiar with Rammstein at all. It has my personal favorite song, Angle. Love that song. Um, 
an amazing, amazing album where absolutely every song on here is a tour de force. And I've been a huge fan of Rammstein most of my life. And I finally got to see them in concert a few years back. And it was just a hell of a show. And so Rammstein has left an indelible impression on me that will probably last the rest of my life. Uh, I was absolutely blown away by the fact that you realize how unconditional music is. Music is the one eternal language. It doesn't matter what country you're from. You don't have to know what they're saying to enjoy the music and to get a feeling from it. And I think Rammstein is very good at evoking a feeling. So there you go. Number six, Rammstein, and the album is Zinso. Judas Priest makes number five, and this is middle of the road for a very specific reason. When I was growing up, my favorite band was Judas Priest. I literally had every album they had ever made, up to a certain point, obviously. And I was just really captivated. And then, on the second half of my life, as much as I hate to say it, I kind of outgrew them. Uh, I wasn't as big a fan of the high-pitched vocals anymore. And sometimes, especially as Rob Halford, the lead singer, got older, the vocals got a little scratchy and a little bit shrill at times. And so that was fine, but I, I just started to gravitate more towards heavier music, heavier uh, rhythms, heavier vocals. I did get more into the growling and the screaming. Um, and I wanted something a little bit more intense. One thing about Judas Priest that I did love was that they evolved with the times and they did try to try new things. Rob Halford specifically, you know, he was in three different bands, Judas Priest, Fight, and Halford. And uh, he actually made an album with Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. And so he did try to keep up with the times and I think they all did a very good job with that. Um, but, you know, when I was young, I got captivated by Hellbent for Leather, um, the whole Defenders of the Faith album, Jawbreaker was in there, it was really good, Rock Hard Rag 3, um, You Got Another Thing Coming, Screaming for Vengeance, all these songs were landmarks, and uh, so they kind of hit home with me, but the reason I got so into Judas Priest was my brother and one of his friends started playing Sin After Sin. This was one of their earliest records in 1978. And it was actually made with a one-off session drummer because they had just dropped the drummer that they had and they were still looking for a new one. And it actually turned out to be one of the best albums, in my opinion, that they've had. Now, it only had eight songs, but every song on there evoked a feeling. They were very good. It had a, uh, a very cool cover of an old Joan Baez song, Diamonds and Rust. She was an old folk singer and they, they sped up the rhythm and the cover was really damn good. Uh, at the end of the album, they had a song called Dissident Aggressor, which was just balls to the wall for the time. In 1978, to have a song this heavy, it was amazing. So, Sin After Sin definitely left a mark on me. Uh, it's a it's an album that I still hold with fond memories, even though I don't listen to it much anymore. Because, like I said, I kind of feel like I've outgrown that style. But, it still helps shape my love of metal music, for sure. Slipknot comes in at number four with the Subliminal Versus Volume 3. Now, this is kind of going back to new metal and a little bit newer band. Uh, Slipknot, I absolutely love. Absolutely love. But when I bought this album, the Subliminal Versus Volume 3, man, it just changed things for me. Uh, it was so aggressive and honestly dark in a way. I don't know too many albums have been. Uh, the song Duality was just intense, but dealt with some intense subject matter too. Um, Every song on here had a purpose, and the aggression in most of the songs, it just blew me away. So, Slipknot, 
one of my favorite bands. Uh, I'm actually very glad they're back. But this is what really started me on them is like, this is a have to have band. Coming in at number three is Tool Laterals. I am a huge, huge fan of Danny Carey, the drummer of Tool. You want to talk about technically sound, this guy hits the mark every time. They do a lot of off time rhythms and a lot of odd rhythms. And they're very experimental and Tool is one of those bands that the further on they've gone in their career, the more experimental they've become. And so I really grew to appreciate Lateralis. From the title track, Lateralis, to Parable, Parabola, uh, absolutely amazing songs. Ticks and Leeches was a great percussion song, which is something that I, I practice so often and uh, really sold me. Schism, their uh, first single was really, really amazing. It, it spent a lot of time in triplets and um, it was a unique sound, but very cool sound at the same time. So Lateralis uh, is number three because it's such an experimental album and still has the same sound that you come to expect from Tool. So it was absolutely great. Every song on there was really, really cool. Number two might be something that people don't expect from me with this list, but it absolutely has to go on and it has to be number two. And that's Stone Temple Pilots Purple. It's the second album from Stone Temple Pilots. And this album, every single song on here was just damn good. And some of the songs were very unique. They had a few songs on this album that were very different. Some were slower, some were faster, some were just made to be jams. Some a little experimental, but it all worked. And actually, one song, Loungefly, uh, <laughs> was the intro to MTV News for years. Um, another song landed on the Crow soundtrack, that being the Big Empty. And you had Unglued, Vaseline, Meat Plow, uh, Kitchenware and Candy Bars. Every song on here was so amazing, honestly. Like, there was not a weak spot on the album. And that's why I have to put it up so high, because honestly, Stone Temple Pilots, I don't know that I can say they're one of my favorite bands. I certainly like them. But it's not something I'm going to throw on every day. But this album, like, even having made this list and just thinking about some of the songs, they just get stuck in my head. And I can't get them out. I wind up having to play these songs because it's just ingrained like an earworm in there. And so for that reason, Stone Temple Pilots Purple comes in at number two. Number one. You know, I really, really fought with this list. I fought with like the albums that had such a huge impact on me personally. And albums that I thought were good beginning to end. Albums that I thought changed the landscape. And I don't know if there is a bigger album that I can say changed the landscape of music during my time than Nirvana's Nevermind, which has to come in at number one. This was an album that came in at the perfect time, had the perfect guy for the front man. This was a time when, like I said, rock and metal ruled the airways. And unfortunately, during the 80s, it was ruled by hair bands. All these guys wore makeup and teased their hair to the moon and for some reason wanted to look like chicks. And while some of them created some very good music, it was a horrible fashion statement. And then in comes grunge. Nirvana, and it was, I've said before, the Grim Reaper sickle that just cut the heads off of all the hair bands. It was literally Nirvana one day, hair bands gone the next. And that's pretty much how it went. And this started a huge influx of Seattle-based bands that started this grunge thing. And it really, really reshaped music for rock and metal. Uh, people were 
you know, wearing loose-fitting clothing now, and then, you know, the grunge thing, I don't know if the look was necessarily what I was a fan of, but I was a really big fan of the fact that it took away the hairbands, and we had something a lot more relatable. And Kurt Cobain, his voice, I think, is unmistakable. His writing is amazing. And every song on Nevermind was pretty damn good, and I think people still listen to it to this day with fond memories. And I, I'm no exception. There are still times when I'll listen to something from the Nevermind album and just jam out because it's good. So, number one has to be Nirvana. Absolutely. They changed the absolute course of rock and metal music. Changed the landscape forevermore. And uh, it was an album I bought when it came out. And I was just like everybody else. I was blown away. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. There is my list of the top 10 rock and metal bands that have affected my life. Um, rock and metal band albums, I should say. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. That is the top 10 rock and metal albums that have affected my life. Um, I think that every album on here in some way has kind of made me grow, especially as a percussionist. Because I have learned from these guys, especially Danny Carey, who I have tried to mold myself after. Um, but all very good bands. If you haven't heard of any of those, uh, hopefully I was able to post some of the music. I wasn't able to post all the music because of copyrights. But I gave you a taste of what I could. But if you haven't heard of them, go check them out. It's absolutely worth it. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this list. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe, and share. Let me know what your list is in the comments. My name is Kevin Jackowitz, Cage Nation, out.